good, very good. Well, let's get underway. Um, I've got quite a few things to share with you this afternoon, so um, I'll try and move along at a fairly, fairly cracking pace and look forward to hearing your reactions in the chat and so forth um, as we go along. So the first thing to share with you is the roadmap for the talk this afternoon. Um, I want to take you through the ACE part of ACING, um, which is uh, about altruism, compassion and empathy, and making the case really, the, the, the benefits that we can get uh, for people and organizations by applying the ACE uh, attributes. We're gonna take a look at psychological safety and trust, of course. Uh, this is a, a basic requirement, I feel. Um, I'm gonna share some reflections on what makes mental well-being in Singapore at the moment, uh, thinking of the current state here, uh, and also globally as well. And I'm gonna be asking you to take part in a, a, a poll uh, as well, just to sort of see what, what you all think. Uh, we'll look at employee well-being and what happens when we apply the ACE model and I'll deconstruct altruism, compassion, and empathy for you uh, so that we can really get into the weeds. And then some concluding thoughts um, at the end. So I'll be looking to uh, uh, end up the session in about 45 minutes, and we will have uh, a Q&A thereafter. So let's move on. Well, I think we can probably say that there is um, a really urgent case to, uh, to be made for out more altruism, compassion, and empathy. There's, there's, something that, that we can say that will benefit uh, people and organizations um, and not just from a business point of view as well but from the point of view of uh, being more human and more human in the workplace too and i think you'll probably agree that uh, the two words empathy and compassion um, have really entered the business lexicon during this uh, pandemic era and i guess one of the questions will be uh, can we sustain this in other words what I would welcome as a, a, a very uh, overdue conversation about empathy and compassion. Can we continue that even beyond uh, the current challenges that we face because of COVID? That's a question that will, I think, uh, be very interesting to consider as we go along. Um, there's a lot of research out there about compassion, empathy, and to a degree, um, altruism. I wanted to share just some high level um, notions with you um, as we get into the subject. Um, one of the things we know is that compassion um, promotes commitment to the organization, which of course is um, really good from an employer point of view. Compassion also breeds compassion. So when we have leaders who are demonstrating compassion, modeling compassion, um, others learn from this and it, it, it creates a kind of domino effect. One of the wonderful things about compassion, too, is that it works both ways. So the person who is being compassionate to someone else also benefits because we know from studies of brain chemistry that uh, uh, being compassionate to somebody actually does really good things for you as well from a neuro neurological point of view. Very importantly, compassion fosters more collaboration in the workplace because, as we'll see in a little while, um, it helps uh, to uh, deepen psychological safety to the extent that people um, are more inclined to be able to feel comfortable working with each other. Another set of benefits that we can see from the research is that um, case, various case studies show that it can actively uh, reduce staff turnover. Um, it fosters stronger bonds between co-workers. And very importantly, from the point of view of this particular talk, um, it reduces the potential for burnout and uh, uh, it helps better mental health. And for those of you who are interested, um, it creates the right conditions for innovation. Uh, innovation studies show that without psychological safety, you're just not going to get the best kind of ideas that you could get if people feel really comfortable about sharing their ideas and their opinions. If people are fearful uh, that they might have their idea be, um, if you like, put down or ridiculed in some way, then they will not. Uh, volunteer such ideas. The following slides um, are quite busy in that they um, take content from various resource resources and re research sources too and uh, you'll be very welcome to read through these when we send you the full slide deck afterwards. So I'm just going to sort of pick out a few key things. Effective commitment is this issue, this, this point about 
uh, people feeling more connected to their organization uh, when we have more compassionate workplaces. And as you can see here, compassion breeds compassion. Um, we need managers to be, to be modeling that behavior. Um, as I mentioned, um, the person who is witnessing a compassionate act will also benefit from, uh, from compassion. So these are the resource uh, and res research sources, as I might say, where you can look to get even more information about how compassion shows up. And here's the, here's the data that you would need to look at those uh, stronger bonds, uh, the, the, the lowering of the likelihood for burnout and also improved innovation. What about empathy then? Um, well, empathy has been shown to be linked to ethical decision-making and ethical leadership. If we have leaders who are literally able to see the world from the perspective of others, this will help to uh, give them a much more rounded picture of um, uh, what a decision will require. We also know from uh, a number of studies that empathy, particularly in healthcare, can lead to very positive health outcomes and uh, improved patient and staff um, satisfaction uh, results as well. There are a number of studies in the US, for example, that show that people who have been through active empathy training, in the US they tend to call it virtuousness training, where they compare cohort groups that have been through the training and who have not been through the training, the um, results over time, so three years out, five years out, show that the the basic KPIs of uh, patient and uh, care uh, uh, results are much better in the cohort groups that have been through this kind of empathy training. And even more excitingly, um, the longevity of the people that they're caring for also increases, which is an amazing thing. Um, I know on the call, and um, there will be various friends who are uh, active in the area of intercultural communication. And we know that empathy for leaders who are managing uh, diverse and also dispersed teams is incredibly important too. So if we're able to sort of see the world through the eyes of someone who is from a different culture, that will be incredibly helpful as we um, go about our work. So these are some of the organizational benefits that we can look forward to if we have more empathy in organizations. So positive impacts on innovation, the ethical leadership that I've mentioned, better outcomes in healthcare, and also, uh, we see it as a key skill for leaders across cultures and those who are leading diverse teams. I've created this very, very simple model, which I call the ACE model. And you can see that uh, on the outer ring, we have empathy. Uh, the inner ring, we have uh, compassion. Then at the center, we have altruism. Um, there is a reason for doing this. And um, hopefully that will become a bit clearer as um, I go through the talk, um, as we see the the interaction between empathy, compassion, and altruism, and also the connections that exist between them. So one of, the per, one of the people who's been very active in terms of looking at psychological safety is the Harvard professor, um, Amy Edmondson. And I can thoroughly recommend to you her book, uh, which is called The Fearless Organization, uh, Creating Psychological Safety in the Workplace for Learning, Innovation, and Growth. And she says, I think very importantly here, the fearless organization is one in which interpersonal fear is minimized so that the team and organizational performance can be maximized in a knowledge intensive world. So for those of you interested to know a little bit more about Amy's work, um, you might like to uh, explore via the internet um, the seven questions that uh, uh, Amy asks uh, in terms of finding out whether um, the workplace that you're in is psychologically safe or not. So um, more about that later. But uh, as I say, Amy's a great uh, resource for psychological safety. I like to think of the ACE model as being maybe one, one possible thing that we can use to promote an environment to support um, better mental health. So I'm, I'm just getting a message that I might be um, appearing a little bit uh, a little bit quiet. Is that better? Is that better, Kerry? Can you hear yes. me a little bit? Yep, it's better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. So yes, so promoting an environment to support 
uh, better mental health. It's what I'm really interested in. Um, I was, I guess, lucky enough to attend a really interesting event on uh, bullying in Singapore a short while ago. And what was very interesting to me was that a lot of the conversation was about what do we do now that we have a bullying issue at work? So is it a question of, um, that we need to start thinking about uh, bringing in lawyers? Uh, what are we going to do about the bullying issue that we have? And it struck me that um, if we could possibly look further upstream in terms of um, organizational life and, and start asking questions about how we could create a better workplace environment in the first place, such that we could mitigate the potential for phenomena such as bullying to occur, wouldn't that be a great thing? And so in, in light of that, I'll just sort of um, advance the slide again. So in light of that, um, I started looking at uh, mental health reports uh, as they relate particularly to business. And I wanted to share this, this report with you that was put out by something called the Shaw Mind Foundation, which is a UK-US based um, mental health uh, support foundation. And this is something that they came out with before COVID. So I, I put here, this was advice even before COVID hit us. And this is what they said. They said, some areas we suggest focusing on are limiting working hours and out of office email access. Where possible, avoid isolated work. If a person works from home, then ensure regular check-ins with them. And setting attainable deadlines and spreading the workload across teams will be very important. Provide support services and staff members who are trained to deal with workplace stress and promote healthy eating and regular exercise. So even before COVID, there was a recognition that if you were working from home, there would need to be some kind of support in order to be able to help you with that aspect of mental health and being, um, being isolated. So what I'd like to do is to invite you guys to take part in a poll. And uh, this poll is, is asking the question, which of the following mental health disorders is most prevalent globally? So is it depression? Is it alcohol use disorders? Drug use disorders? Bipolar? Is it anxiety and anxiety disorders? Is it eating disorders? Or is it schizophrenia? Okay, so... What we see here is uh, a top of the listing, depression and anxiety. So they're quite far ahead of the other um, options that, uh, that you were offered. So um, thank you for taking part in that. So neck and neck, depression and anxiety. Okay, hold on to that thought for a moment because what I'm going to show you now is uh, the result of a poll that was, uh, or, or a study that was done um, which looked at the prevalence of mental and substance use disorder throughout the world back in 2017. It takes a while to be able to compile a full picture globally of what this looks like. But very interestingly, you can see, as you, you guys have predicted, that uh, anxiety and depression um, are at the top of the table. Um, and interestingly, I think um, sometimes... Um, we may not think about anxiety in the first instance, we think perhaps more about depression. And what this data suggested to me was that um, if we could do something, even a small amount of effort to uh, help us to have workplaces that do not create anxiety for people, if we could do even a small amount in that area, then the exponential benefit for people, for human beings would be really, really super. So our job is, is our, our work is cut out, I think, to try to reduce anxiety in the workplace. In terms of what's happening in Singapore, I'm not sure if, if some of you might have managed to catch this, uh, this interview between uh, Dr. Sanjeev there and uh, Serene Seng, which happened a week or so ago, but they were in conversation about the um, current situation as regards mental well-being uh, in Singapore. And um, I thought that um, what Dr. Nair was sharing was really very, very interesting. 
So first of all, um, he made the point that um, people go through different phases. So um, if we're talking about an increase in mental uh, ill health in Singapore at the moment, the situation um, is very, very dynamic. So people change all the time, as we know. Now, even with recognizing that, Dr. Nair said that he felt that from, um, in terms of looking at calls to helplines, uh, emergency services, um, requests for consultations with general practitioners, there has been an uptick, an uptick in demand. And as he put it so very well, the reasons for this are actually very simple because what we're facing in our world right now is that the fabric of things and our routine is, is being disrupted. And um, it's at times like that that people can go through or be in danger of uh, going through a psychological crisis. And as Dr. Nair put it, I think also very nicely, change brings, a, brings about a kind of uneasiness in people. And so he said, there's undoubtedly, it's undoubtedly the fact that we are seeing um, more of a need for support, an increase in demand for support for people during these very difficult times. And again, uh, just to sort of share with you, I happen to be watching uh, the international news last night and uh, a story from the UK says that there has been um, a huge increase in the number of um, uh, young women um, suffering from eating disorders uh, since the start of the COVID period as well, which is again, um, a very worrying trend um, and something that we, we probably also need to pay attention to. So as we move on, therefore, the fact is that COVID has created mental stress uh, of a kind that perhaps we haven't seen before. So this is data from the UK and from the United States, which compares uh, the reports of adults saying that they, have, they are suffering the symptoms of depression. So before the pandemic and, and then during the pandemic. And you can see that uh, this is really uh, increasing. And the headline there, COVID's mental health toll scientists track a surge in depression. And for those of you who'd like to maybe um, track down this, uh, this uh, uh, research source, um, that comes from Nature magazine. And again, you'll be able to read Alison Abbott's uh, work in, in full there. So the picture is getting very clear. So what I'd like to just ask you guys is, if we stop for a moment and thought, so, okay, what organizational benefits might we be able to enjoy if we manage to raise awareness around mental health? We know that for a long time, it's been very difficult for people to talk about mental health uh, issues. Um, but what would happen, do you think? What, what would the benefits be if we could raise, successfully raise mental, mental health as a subject in organizations and encourage people to talk about it? Would anybody like to pop into the chat uh, anything that you think? Vincent says solidarity, yeah. So, you know, uh, bringing, bringing people together. Yeah, okay, thank you, Vincent, yep. Very good. Erica says employees will feel that their leaders care. Yes, yes, lovely, lovely. Very, very important that employees feel <laughs> that their leaders care. Extremely important, yes. Thank you. Just checking. Yeah, we've got some other comments coming in here. Yeah, May, May mentions here that productivity could, could well increase. Yes, I think so. And of course, we wouldn't want to say that, you know, productivity gains are the name of the game and that's why we're doing this. But I think the fact is that, that we could look to see productivity gains uh, as well. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Great. Vincent has also suggested that we could perhaps address vulnerability publicly. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, interestingly, uh, I read an article um, about uh, uh, comments that uh, Prince Harry had made about mental health and he said that one of the things that used to irritate him when he was being asked about his own mental health was um, people might say to him, uh, don't you think you should see someone? And he was saying that if you say to somebody who you think is suffering, don't you think you should see someone about this? 
um, they may actually do the exact opposite and, and, and actively not seek help. Um, so what we've got to do is almost uh, think of ways to come up alongside people. Uh, so for example, there was a suggestion that uh, if you felt somebody was suffering, particularly at this time during COVID, um, it might be good to have a conversation that runs along the lines of, you know, I've been feeling, you know, uh, pretty low and pretty challenged by COVID myself, you know, how, how are you feeling? In order to elicit a conversation that is not threatening. So Valerie suggesting a collaborative culture. Yes, absolutely, Valerie, yes. Erica makes the point that uh, um, if, if we're in a, if we're in any doubt that uh, the situation is is uh, very dire uh, in respect to the person, then then clearly we need to refer refer them to an expert. And uh, Erica mentions a medical doctor here. Absolutely, I think this is the key thing also for um, those of us in the community who do a lot of coaching with people. I think it's very important to recognise where your own professional um, boundaries stop and boundaries picked up by by people who are professionally trained trained to to deal with uh, uh, specific issues that people have so let's move on so in terms of the examining the ace model i wanted to share a few things with you guys and um uh, first of all i wanted to look at altruism because this is probably one of the least uh well researched perhaps of the three items altruism compassion and empathy and um, if I go to the next slide, um, it's really interesting that uh, altruism started actually with this gentleman who's called Auguste Comte. And Auguste Comte coined the, the word altruism um, as a way to indicate the opposite of egoism, if you like, or self-orientation. And as a definition, altruism, as you can see here, is the moral practice of concern for the happiness of other people. Now, um, how, does this, how does this pan out? Well, altruism is when we act to promote someone else's welfare, even at a risk or cost to our own. And you can see here that studies have found that people's first impulse is to cooperate with each other rather than compete. And that toddlers, so really you know, little children, they spontaneously help people. Uh, when they when they need help, out of a genuine concern for their welfare, and you can see from the picture here that even non-human primates uh, will display altruism. So this is a very interesting, uh, I think, slightly understudied area. But what's so so fascinating to me is that um, we we are seeing a paradigm shift, and that paradigm shift, as I've indicated here, started about twenty years ago. And we are coming to a point where people and organizations are realizing that altruism is something that we can invite ourselves and others to consider more in our daily lives and in the workplace. And this is work done by uh, Jane Allen Eljavin and Hongwen Chang uh, from the Department of Sociology originally at the University of Wisconsin. So we're reaching a point where altruism is becoming something that people want to look at more seriously and consider as a, a, a very important part, not only of, of the workplace, but also, whoops, excuse me, uh, but also in terms of, uh, so we'll come back to this, but also in terms of sustainability, for example. So I'll just uh, forward here. Yeah. So Here's a, a rather busy table that I wanted to share with you, which is um, looking at different types of altruism. I haven't got um, a huge amount of time to go through all of this with you, but um, I hope you enjoy perhaps some um, scampering through it uh, when you get the overall presentation. Um, at the top, we have um, the motivation to do good things for each other, right the way through to selflessness. And what's very important, I think, in a business context is to think about this phenomenon of virtue signaling, which is doing something for others out of a desire for recognition or publicity. So even as, for example, organizations think about altruism and doing things that, uh, that are altruistic, they need to be really, really careful that these things are authentic and that they're not just uh, designed to make the company look good. And this is where, for example, we see in uh, sustainable 
sustainability terms. Um, it's a very important debate around the, the notion of greenwashing, for example, where organizations will try to provide data to prove that they are um, uh, helping with the environment and helping with social issues and helping with governance, whereas in fact, um, uh, the, the, the data might just be part of a greenwashing effort. So um, ho ho hopefully you can have a, another look at uh, altruism uh, through that particular listing. For me, the biggest piece in terms of altruism is the connection that it has with sustainability. And as you can see here, very importantly, the famous um, American cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead, she said, we won't have a society if we, if we destroy the environment. So for me, working, thinking about sustainability is incredibly important because it's the most altruistic thing that we can do for the people who are coming after us. In other words, our descendants. In other words, the people who are not yet born. What could be more altruistic than that? And that's why I think uh, when companies particularly are talking about being altruistic, it's incredibly important that they act on that notion and try to support the sustainability agenda. If we move very quickly to compassion, um, I'll just take you through this uh, in, in a jiffy. So let's deconstruct compassion to make it a little bit more accessible. I think for a lot of people, um, compassion seems to be very a very pink and fluffy thing, very difficult to pin down. Um, first off, I think we need to recognize that it's important that when we are talking to somebody and when we are uh, wanting to be compassionate to someone, that we, that we realize that the troubles that the person is going through um, are serious troubles and that the troubles that the person is suffering from are not self-inflicted. Um, and we need to be able to picture ourselves going through a similar uh, challenge as the person with whom we are trying to uh, be compassionate. These things I think are really very, very important. What I'd like to share with you in terms of making compassion a bit more accessible is to suggest that there are at least six ways in which we can deconstruct compassion. The first is to ask ourselves the question, how alive to the suffering of others are we? So for example, do we uh, do we, for example, listen well to people? And how much do we really notice about people, maybe family members or people we work with? If people are not happy, if people are, for example, anxious and uh, perhaps heading towards a de depressive episode, how much do we actually notice about that? And are we really present for people? So when someone's talking to you, are you really listening to them? Um, interestingly, I've done quite a bit of work with CEOs and uh, um, some of you will be familiar with the, the uh, 360 degree feedback tool whereby um, people are asked to rate themselves on various attributes of leadership uh, and other people are asked to rate them uh, as well. And very often, um, I'm, uh, forgive, all, forgive me, all the CEOs in the audience, but very often CEOs, when they're asked, how good are your, how good are your listening skills? They will say on a, on a scale of uh, zero to 10, um, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nine, you know, I'm, I'm really good. Uh, they don't want to put 10 because they think that might be a bit, uh, a bit uh, lacking in, in modesty. But then when you compare it to their peers, or rather their direct reports in this case, the direct reports say, well, actually, no, the boss is probably about a four or a five, you know, he or she is not actually a very good listener. They think they're a good listener, but they're not really. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done by uh, a lot of senior leaders to actually um, listen to people in the first place. Second thing is about being um, non-judgmental. So very often when, you know, when we have a friend or a colleague who comes and shares with us, um, problems that they're going through, um, it's very easy for us to think, um, oh, you know, you caused your own problems, you know, um, it's your fault, right? But we need to stop that and we need to meet people where they are. So not make a judgment about the, perhaps the, 
the poor decisions that people have made. We need to meet them where they are, so don't judge. Distress tolerance is about being uh, able to, um, to be of service to people. Um, here, uh, we need to watch out that we don't over-identify with the person's problem as well. And we need to ensure that we have ourselves the emotional bandwidth to help people. So it's important that we look after ourselves. I don't know how many times you know people will have approached you and said that they're going through a difficult period and you think to yourself well I, I i would really truly love to help you but i am also going through a difficult time myself and i'm not sure if i have that bandwidth so we need to look after ourselves as well and then in terms of being empathetic or empathic this is where i think um, empathy and compassion is very interesting because sometimes when we're empathetic there's a ten tendency for us to to jump to solutions mode. Um, I do this all the time with my wife. You know, I, she, she tells me something she's uh, having to deal with and I process it. I listen to her and then I say, okay, this is what you need to do. And she says, Michael, that's not what I'm asking you. What I'm doing is asking you to listen to me. I've actually worked out what I'm going to do, but I actually just need you to empathize with my situation. So people are not necessarily looking for solutions, but they are looking for somebody to be able to listen, to understand their perspective. So try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And that involves, of course, the listening that we've had before. It also, in, 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 uh, act, in, it also means actively trying to learn more about human behavior. And one of the things that we're finding in, in the area of empathy is that curiosity, curiosity about other people is really important for developing uh, empathy so be curious i'm not suggesting you should be nosy but i think you, you you would maybe benefit a lot if you were able to be um, a bit curious about people and then the thing that i love about compassion which is a bit different to empathy is that compassion is about action it's about doing things okay and this is how it differs from empathy because when you empathize with someone you might say well you know, I, I can see what, 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 what's troubling you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do anything about it, okay? Whereas compassion means that you really do need to help the person. This is how it differs from empathy. The other thing to bear in mind is that you have to check that your compassion is going to be welcome because sometimes, even though you want to be compassionate to someone, maybe they don't want you to be compassionate to them. So you always, always need to check before you act. And then I touched on this a little bit, but this... This uh, phenomenon, if you like, or this aspect of um, um, self-compassion is also incredibly important. So we need to sort of learn how to uh, be good to ourselves, uh, to help, help ourselves to avoid um, burnout. And as a concept, I would say it's becoming more and more mainstream now. And there's some wonderful literature out there, wonderful support that uh, you can look for uh, in terms of helping with uh, with self-compassion. Mindfulness, for example, is, is one particular area. For those of you who'd like to look at uh, self-compassion in more detail, um, I think Kristen Neff is one of the world's leading scholars based in the US. Uh, she looks at uh, self-compassion, has done some really great work on that. And also Brené Brown, wh who will be known to many of you. And as Kristen Neff says here, it's not about self-pity, self-indulgence, or, or anything to do with self-esteem. It's uh, about looking after you I'm not going to dwell too much on this particular model in the interests of time, but I just wanted to say that, um, to my mind, uh, for those of you who are concerned with leaders and leadership development, um, it's worth bearing in mind, I think, that really effective leaders, I think, are those that have high levels of compassion towards others and high levels of compassion towards themselves. So they know how to look out of themselves so that they can be of service to others. And... Uh, you can see uh, that in the bottom corner, you can see in the, sorry, in the bottom corner, uh, low compassion and high self-compassion. This is what I call the narcissist. Uh, and these are people who I'm, I'm absolutely guarantee in your organizations, maybe not the, your current organization, but throughout your career. These are the people who, who are singularly disinterested in other people. They do not show compassion to other people but they are very, very interested in themselves. And this is where perhaps, um, and I'm pushing the envelope a little bit here, um, high self-compassion actually morphs into something else, which is much more self, 
absorbed. And this is where we find the narcissistic personality. And as I say, I would, I would bet that many of you think of people who would fall into that category already, some of the some of the is and managers that you will have come across in your uh, organizations. Does it does all of this matter? Absolutely, it does. There are more and more reports now which show that if bosses in particular are out of touch with the sentiment of uh, the employees, um, this is not a good place to be. So this is a report from the US and it says very interestingly um, uh, about empathy. It says, whoops, excuse me. It says workplace empathy. What leaders don't know can hurt them. So if you as a leader are not aware of how your uh, uh, workforce is thinking about, about you and about empathy, then that is not a good place to be. So you can see here that there's a, uh, a gap between what CEOs' perceptions are about the level of empathy in their organizations and the number of employees who think that their organization is empathetic. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning empathy here is that uh, in my conversations with uh, organizations right now, um, senior people, um, CEOs in particular, they're much more inclined to be able to talk about empathy, uh, are probably less inclined to talk about compassion, because I think empathy has that sort of quasi-scientific ring to it, which makes it feel a little bit more, in inverted commas, serious. Um, but for my money, empathy and uh, compassion are equally uh, important. Looking at empathy then, um, empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. Um, very interestingly, I think, um, the concept of empathy, is, or the, rather the word itself, is actually quite a new one. And it comes from this German word, Einfühlung, which means in feeling. And it was imported by German emigre psychologists uh, into the United States, so that by 1913, um, empathy had become the accepted translation of this word, this German word, Einfühlung. And uh, you can hear, read more about this in a really, really good book called uh, Empathy, a History by Susan Banzoni, um, whereby empathy, as I say, as a word, is actually very new. I mentioned that empathy starts with curiosity. Um, this gentleman, Peter Bregman, has written a really nice piece. Uh, is covered in the um, Harvard Business Review. It's a, a case study, again, for those of you who are about curiosity, um, please do give that uh, a little look. In terms of all of these different uh, terms, um, I gathered this table together just to try and make a bit of sense for everybody of where things are similar and where things are different. So very often, and particularly when we think of um, uh, certain languages, for example, that translate sympathy empathy and compassion, sometimes uh, the word is the same, but actually the concepts are different. And as you can see here, sympathy is great, but actually in, in, to my mind, it, it's not, not truly useful in terms of improving the human condition because it doesn't necessarily imply any action whatsoever. Um, it might make us feel good to send somebody a sympathy card in hospital, for example, but does it really do any good? I'm not really sure that it does. So compassion is, it has evidence-based outcomes. There is data and research to support the fact that more compassionate workplaces are good for everyone and good for the business. Empathy, equally so. However, big thing to bear in mind about empathy, empathy is very, very vulnerable to bias. And as you can see here, and again, for those of you who are interested in learning a bit more, great book by Paul Bloom, which is called Against Empathy. Uh, it's not saying that empathy is bad or that we shouldn't have empathy, but what it's saying, and you can see here in the middle, the middle bullet point, we are more prone to feel empathy for attractive people and for those who look like us or who share our ethnic or, or national uh, background. So while empathy is really good, we have to also guard against the fact that we're more likely to be empathetic to people who are like us, and we need to work harder on that. Um, the last few things that I'd like to share with you is this sort of emergent area of, um, I guess, uh, uh, interpersonal relationships, and that's something called um, weak tie networks. And as you can see here, uh, what we mean by weak tie networks are these networks that uh, uh, we have, people who in, in, 
inhabit our everyday landscape. Okay, so it's it's the it's the street cleaner who you see every morning. You say hi to him or her. Um, it's the barista in your local in your local coffee shop. They recognize you. You recognize them. You may not know their name. They may not know your name either. But the fact is that um, recognizing each other uh, in the street does very good things to your mental state. Why? Because it's reaffirming the fact that you exist and that you are taking up a corner in the universe. We know, for example, that older people um, will very often report um, not only that they feel lonely, but they also feel that they don't exist. They, they, don't, they report not being seen. And this is very, very interesting when it comes to uh, 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 good mental health. Studies in China have shown that where we have um, senior citizens who are um, perhaps suffering from um, Alzheimer's or dementia, actively encouraging these weak tie networks, people who they see again and again every day, is really good uh, for their overall mental well-being. Um, for those of you who are interested to learn more about uh, Weak Tie Networks or WTN, um, this gentleman, Mark Granovetter, um, wrote a seminal paper about this. And he, he suggested, perhaps for the very first time, that weak ties, weak tie networks, are actually more important to us than strong tie networks. In other words, if we only ever rely on input from people within our own circle, and we do not talk with or interact with people that are further away from us. We're not going to, for example, um, improve our, our perspective on things. And also in a business context, um, if we're looking to be innovative, creative, and to do things differently, if we're constantly returning to the same pool for inspiration, we talk to the same people, uh, we don't actively try to broaden our networks, then this is not good from an innovation point of view either. So I would thoroughly recommend thinking of ways that we can improve our weak tie networks. Most more recently, um, I, I noticed this uh, article that was carried in the Bangkok Post, um, but it's origi it originally comes from a piece written by Carlo Ratti from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And here, here's what he said. He said, at MIT, we have been analyzing the content of the Institute's email servers to measure how the abrupt closure of our campus changed our distributions of strong and weak ties. The results confirmed what many reported anecdotally, which is that in the virtual world, our opportunities to meet and to maintain our weak ties fade away. And so what he says is we are living increasingly in airtight echo chambers consigned to tight networks of our strongest ties. In other words, our world is in danger of getting smaller. Okay, let's move on in the interest of time. In terms of psychological safety and trust, um, I think we don't have time for a group discussion in the chat at the moment, but if we just, uh, if we just move on, I wanted to share a few quick things with you. Um, John Bowlby is uh, uh, a British psychologist who first came up with the notion of attachment theory, which is the bonds that are built between a child and a significant caregiver. And it led in later years to the um, evolution of something called secure base. Okay, so from attachment theory to secure base. And secure base has moved into the um, business world as a way of questioning whether managers and leaders represent the kind of secure base that people need. Now, if there is no secure base in an organization, we're likely to see that there's no psychological safety uh, either. And how we know that there's no psychological safety in the workplace is um, when we see these things happening. So when you have it, right, people see mistakes as opportunities to learn. But when you don't have it, people see mistakes as a threat to your career. Uh, when you have psychological safety, as you can see here, you're okay to stick your neck out. In other words, to express your opinion, say what you think about things. Uh, but where psychological safety is not present, uh, you're in danger of getting your, your head cut off. 
So psychological safety, as we can see, has been responsible for a number of uh, business failures over the years. Volkswagen is one good example. This chap, Martin Winterkorn, was the CEO of, uh, of VW until the emissions scandal in the US. And he learned the tricks of the trade in terms of the culture that he created at VW from this gentleman, Ferdinand Pich. And as you can see from the uh, quotation here, he was asked by Bob Lutz, who's the CEO of um, Chrysler, what the secret source was to being successful at VW. And you can see from this quotation that Ferdinand Pich would basically say to people, if you don't come up with uh, the goods, I will basically fire you. That is his, that was his style of leadership. It was quintessential leadership by fear. Likewise, Nokia, Nokia is often held up as an example of a company that didn't read science that it needed to be innovative but at the same time the culture at Nokia um, and he is the CEO at the time this guy used to walk around shouting at the top of his lungs uh, and as people reported it was very difficult to tell him things that he didn't want to hear we had a question from the audience earlier on how, how, how can we deal with things when we have a manager who um, behaves in this kind of way and I think it's about working on the co corporate culture um, overall and perhaps we can talk more about that in the Q&A a little bit later. I mentioned empathy being um, the word of the moment for many people in organizations right now. And um, to be honest, when I talk to um, uh, people about empathy and about bringing empathy into the organization, and I say to them, what, what exactly are you going to do to bring empathy into the organization? They will say, well, um, I'm planning to listen more. I'm gonna be listening more. And I always say, well, that's great. You know, it's fantastic that you that you should be listening more. And I would certainly welcome that. But there are a lot more things that you could do to bring empathy into your organization. And I'm not going to go through all of these here, but just super quick. If you're in the HR community, in the HR um, area, um, going through existing policies and practices and asking, is there any way that we can make these more um, accessible to people? Can we, can we talk to people more about them? Can we make them more aware about what the policies and practices are such that people know what's, what's available, for example? Um, sometimes people sort of complain about the company because they don't actually know uh, what the company can offer. Them. So just being really clear about that and, and being open to talking to people is incredibly important. Number two, consider cross-generational leadership training and development. There is some evidence to, su to suggest that millennials and of course coming into the work workplace um, in, in, a, in, a, in a short while, Gen Z, this generation is much more likely to be open to the notion of talking about empathy and being empathetic than perhaps people of my generation, the, the baby boomers. So that's why, again, if you're in the HR area and you're thinking about leadership development, um, actively ask some of the younger members of, of the team what they think about it, and, and maybe even ask them to help you to co-design such, a, such a, an intervention. Organizational compassion is, is another very important and developing field right now. Um, this is where, uh, organizations look at how they might be able to codify uh, compassionate uh, responses to particular issues in, in the workplace. I worked with a client, for example, who uh, told me that uh, they had two employees who were given a cancer diagnosis and one of them passed away. The other um, was able to come back to work after uh, a period of treatment. And um, the, the CEO told me that his senior management team really uh, put their arms around this person, figuratively speaking, and they did everything they could to cover the person's work. Um, it, it was wonderful what they did. And when we, we all got together to discuss this, this was a compassionate act towards one individual in a given situation in a given company. And the question that came up for the senior management team was, is this something that we can repeat? whenever we have this kind of situation, when somebody has a cancer diagnosis, can it be codified in terms of our response? And do you know, most, most of the people in that group decided that this was a, a, a highly situational um, uh, thing and that for them, they should put it in the too difficult box. It was too difficult to, to deal with. Why? Because the person that they were helping 
had been around in the company for 10 years. So the human relationships were very strong. And the problem for the company was to ask, when they asked themselves the question, if we hired somebody and three months later they had a cancer diagnosis, would our organizational compassionate response be the same or different? Very, very interesting uh, question um, to consider. So I'm conscious of the time. I've just got a few things that I want to um, just cover with you very briefly. Um, I mentioned some of the actions that you can take to develop empathy at an individual level, and also things that you can do as a, a leader to develop um, compassion. So um, ask yourself, for example, are you a secure base for your colleagues? Will people come to you to talk to you? And then um, perhaps the, the nexus of, of where um, psychological safety, I begin, I believe, starts is in terms of your own self-awareness, who you are as a person, the self-compassion, caring for yourself so that you can care for, for others. This, I think, is one of the bedrocks of creating psychological safety. So the key takeaways that I'd like to share with you is that psychological safety is critical for mental well-being. My earlier point was that if we could work on creating better, warmer, more human corporate cultures, in other words, addressing issues before they have an opportunity to blow up, this could be good. Leaders, I've mentioned CEOs quite a lot in this talk, they play a vital role in creating safe spaces in organizations. Safe spaces encourage people to stay on, so that's good for retention. They also have, uh, it also has a very good benefit for um, employer brand. And also, as we know, anybody who's thinking of joining your organization can find out a lot about, about your organization. Um, and if one of the things that you're known for is that you have and you practice a human workplace where people feel safe, that's going to attract talent into the organization. So trust is a key thing that uh, we need to develop as well. And putting all of these things together, competence, ethical behavior, compassion, altruism, and empathy. And I think we have, if you like, uh, a really winning, winning formula for successful teams. So this is the last couple of slides. I truly believe that altruism, compassion, and empathy um, hold the key to developing um, more human workplaces. They are core human capital management pra practices, and they will bring these benefits, as you can see here. We'll do one last poll, and then I think we'll finish then, um, uh, Kerry, so that um, uh, we can take some questions. But um, from what you've heard, I'm really, really curious to find out um, which of the following do you think you would be inclined to work on most um, to improve mental well-being in the workplace? What would be, what would for you be the most uh, important thing to work on? I'm really curious to see what you think. So, excellent, excellent. That's a, that's a really encouraging result. So empathy, yeah, it has that practical feel to it, I think, that appeals to a lot of people. But I'm really encouraged by the fact that um, compassion is also regarded as a, a very important piece. And um, I, I'm also very encouraged to see that altruism too is really very much in the picture. So thank you, thank you so much for taking part in that poll. Lovely. So um, I will just uh, reduce that and then we'll see about some um, rounding up because we're coming up to four o'clock now. Um, um, if any of you are interested, um, I, I've just written this book, it's called Expert Humans, um, Critical Leadership Skills for a Disruptive World, where I uh, discuss the um, ACE attributes um, and also look at some of the ma major disruptors in our world today. So um, just find very brief to mention that. And then um, I'll just close there by saying, thank you all very much indeed for your kind attention. Yep. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for your very enlightening presentation. You're welcome. Okay, so before we start the Q&A, uh, if you would like to request for the presentation deck, please take some time to fill out the feedback form at the end of the session. So the, the slides will be sent to you a few days later. So if you have any questions for Michael, 
please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So as we have limited time, we may not be able to answer all questions. So if your question is not answered, please contact Michael directly with the contact details on the screen or email us and we will forward your queries to him. Okay, now let me get the ball rolling with the first question. Okay, we, uh, so Michael, I received this question. It's one of the pre-event questions from our participants. Yes. So um, this person would like to know how to build a healthy workplace culture that mm. encourages workers to voice their voice con their work concerns. I think for this attendee, he's particularly concerned about the direct manager's management style. Indeed, indeed. Well, you know, um, I was giving a talk on compassion to a group of people who were um, part of a, a global insurance company, Kerry, and uh, uh, halfway through the, um, uh, the session, one of the gentlemen put up his hand and he said, hey, Michael, I, I kind of get this compassion thing. Um, and I only have one question for you, and that is, when do you switch it off? And I said to him, I'm not really sure I understand your question, because it's not a question of switching compassion off. That's not what we're talking about. And he said, well, you know, when you've been nice to people and you've kind of remembered to uh, ask them about their partner and you know that their kid is going to university soon. So you ask a question about that and you kind of make nice with people and they still don't do what you want them to do. Isn't that the point at which you have to switch off the compassion? And I said, well, no, not really. I think we're talking about completely different things. And at that point, he just switched off and he decided not to listen anymore. And at the end of the session, the two HR colleagues who had asked me to give the talk came to see me and they said, hey, Michael, we're really sorry that that gentleman was a, a bit, you know, rough, a bit tough. I said, no problem at all. He has the, he has the right to ask his, his uh, question. And then they said to me, you might like to know that this uh, person is currently the subject not of one but two cases of bullying internally in the organization and so then i said to, to them do i get to ask you a question now and they said yeah sure and i said is this man by any chance your top earner is this man by any chance the person who brings in the top dollars and both of the hr people looked at each other they didn't say anything but their facial expression told the whole story. Mm. And then eventually one of them said, yeah, he's the one who brings in the most money, yeah. And I said, well, you know, at the end of the day, you guys and HR people have a very important role to play here. You guys are the ones who, who help to shape and determine what the corporate culture will be. And you have to ask the question, are we okay with tolerating that kind of behavior and i would suggest that more and more we will find situations where people simply will not stay in organizations when we have that kind of behavior so for the for, for the person who asked a question about when it's the manager who is the who is the problem i would probably say um have a, have a think about the corporate culture try to get other people on site try to sort of think of ways in which you could create what i would call compassion champions other people who think like you do that you don't want to tolerate any more workplaces where uh, people feel frightened or intimidated and i know it's easy to say that but i think there is strength in numbers and the sense i get from the people i talk to is that people are beginning to say enough is enough you know, we do not want to work in these toxic environments anymore but it's going to take all of us to get together to basically say you know in this case the behavior of that manager is just not acceptable yeah i agree hope that helps to answer that question okay i have a very interesting question from mike um he's asking is it true that what the ceos think can never be the same as the staff and or should it not be the same as the staff precisely because he's a ceo Hey Mike, it's it's a great it's a great question. You know, um, I think one of the one of the realities of life is that as people um, move up in a hierarchy, one of the phenomenon phenomenons that we notice is that their weak tie networks become weaker, and they rely more and more on a smaller and smaller group of people who they always talk to. And one of the problems we find is that, uh, depending on the CEO, of course, there are CEOs who, who really don't like to hear bad news. 
and the people around them realize that and they feel that it's probably better just to be um, vague and not really say what, what things are going on. What I think we need CEOs to have are the weak tie networks that people can talk with them and share their, um, their concerns and worries with the CEO. Also, I think CEOs need to, to actively listen to people who do have their finger on the pulse of what's happening at the grassroots to get data points. I'll give you an example. Um, in one of the organizations I worked for, my PA um, said to me, uh, Michael, you seem to think that you've done what's necessary to um, warn the staff about this impending change that is, that is coming, this very big change that is coming. And I said, well, sure. I did um, town halls. I sent a, a, an email. I have talked to one or two people. And so she said, no offense, Michael, but if you think that that is enough to con communicate with people, then I'm really sorry, but that isn't enough. Uh, you're going to have to do better than that because people I'm hearing from say they're, they're not really clear on what you what you're planning to do so it was a real wake-up call to me and it's just just to sort of you know underscore what I'm saying here let's encourage CEOs to um, to develop their weak time networks to talk with lots of people inside and outside the organization um, I will tell you one thing and that is it's got to be authentic though. It has to be authentic. If you're the kind of CEO who thinks that um, you can just walk around the corridors of the, the manufacturing uh, of the company or the manufacturing plant, not that we can do it right now, um, and just call in on people and just say, hey, so how are you doing? Are you all okay? And everybody says, yes, we're fine. And if you think that that is your job done, then you are very much mistaken because people can tell in authenticity a mile off they can tell and we kid ourselves if we think that people are not able to pick up on that i had one example of a ceo who used to call by to see his uh, staff um, every friday afternoon at four o'clock regular as clockwork and he would put his head around the door and he would say to the people just wanted to see whether you guys were okay or not glad to see that you all look like you're smiling excellent have a good weekend. And within about 30 minutes, he had jumped in his car and was driving off towards the golf course. And of course, he seemed to think that people didn't notice that. But people do notice that. And I think if there's one lesson that I've learned over the years, it's we need to be alive to how others are viewing us, especially when we are senior members of staff. And it's important Carry. that the senior management have to walk the talk and not just pay lip service. Yeah. Absolutely, Kerry. Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, the question from TS, uh, she says that uh, it seems that employees' well-being are quite top-down approach. So how do we convince or encourage the top management to have the right mindset for the employees and also to ensure that the compassion and empathy given is not uh, taken advantage of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's such a good question, isn't it? Because I think for it to, to when I say it, when I, by, what I mean is the creation of human, humane, human and humane workplaces. I think it has uh, a joint effort that sort of comes from the top in terms of direction, where the CEO and the senior leadership is saying, this is what our organization represents. But it also needs a groundswell of support uh, from the, the people, if you like, on, uh, on the front line, they have to believe in it as well. And that's why I think thinking about, um, uh, we know, we know. I think those, those colleagues who work in organizational development, for example, know about the power of um, change, change champions, having people who are um, able to advocate for these kinds of changes. But from a very practical point of view, and to answer the question, um, we need to ask not just the CEO, but um, managers to share stories with staff about empathy. If you want to, obviously, share stories about compassion as well. But where staff members have really gone the extra mile, where they've really helped another team member, I, th I think that should be called out uh, and it should be celebrated. 
Um, one of the things I'd noticed in terms of um, interactions with um, three or four uh, Singapore-based organizations very recently is asking a very simple question. Um, how often do you celebrate your success? You know, as a company, when you hit a KPI, when you exceed a particular goal, do, do you actually press the pause button and stop for a moment and, and celebrate that success? What do you do? And do you know, so many organizations say, oh, we haven't got time to do that. You know, we meet, we, we, we reach one milestone and there's always something more that we have to do after that. So Michael, sorry, but we don't have, we don't have time to celebrate. And I'm thinking, you know, it's such a simple thing to do, just to press the pause button and just think to yourselves, wow, we did a good job here, you know? Um, a pat on the back for everybody. And that's the kind of, it's such a simple, simple thing, but I think it's the kind of thing that helps to build, um, you know, a more human workplace. And again, it has to be authentic. It has to be authentic. I had a boss years ago who said to me, oh, Michael, you know, um, uh, the team that you're, you're working with, they seem to be pretty happy. You know, what's the secret to your success? And I said, well, not every Friday, but, you know, occasionally on a Friday, we might go to um, a restaurant, you know, we might have something to eat together. Um, and then we just, you know, um, have, 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 have time to laugh together and just to be together. And this boss looked at me and he said, wow, that's really interesting. I think I might, I think I might try that, he said. And to me, and I think to many on the call, you know, the opportunity to spend time with people, if they want to spend time with you, that is, of course, is, is a wonderful thing to do because that builds the human uh, connection, the human rapport. But there are leaders out there who actually don't realize that. Those narcissistic leaders that I mentioned earlier on, the only thing they're concerned about is their own self-advancement and they really don't care that much about other people. And so we need to try to be the antidote. You know? We need to try to encourage a different way of uh, behaving. And I know, because I've had many conversations about this, people will say to me, Michael, I love the idea of, of being a compassionate manager, guys, but how do I balance being compassionate and holding people accountable? And the reason why people worry about this is that they think that compassionate, being compassionate is about being kind to people or um, it's about being nice to people. But actually, some of the most compassionate things that you can ever do for somebody is to give them the feedback that they don't want to hear and that you don't actually want to give. That is being compassionate. When we, do, when we, when we avoid having difficult conversations with people, it's much more about us and how we feel and so much less about the other person. So for example, I'll give you one, one quick example, uh, Kerry. I sometimes ask uh, people in the room, you know, if you have to make somebody, if you have to retrench somebody, right? Or you have to, you have to, you have to say to them that, you know, um, it's just not working anymore. You know, there isn't a fit for you in this organization. I think all of us hand on heart most of us find those conversations incredibly difficult to, to, to do. And so it's very interesting to ask people, um, imagine a, a major national holiday, you know, depending on, on what traditions you follow, but let's just take Christmas as, a, as an example. I, I will ask a group, do you think it's more compassionate to tell somebody that you're letting them go before Christmas or after Christmas? which is more compassionate. And you know, most groups split more or less 50-50. And then there's a wonderful discussion, if not a good natured argument between those two groups, where one group says, well, you know, uh, you're so mean, you know, you shouldn't tell them before Christmas because then they'll have a miserable Christmas, right? Um, and then the other group will say, but don't you think that, that's, uh, that, that they're not gonna be very happy if they go to Christmas go for Christmas and they max out their credit card and they come back in the new year and they hear then that you're going to actually fire them. In what, in what way is that compassionate? 
So it's situational. When people say to me, so what would you do? I would always have a conversation before Christmas, always, and um, try to, as it were, grasp that, that, that uh, difficult problem and deal with it sooner rather than later, even though it's very, very difficult to do that. It's a tough call indeed. Okay, right now. So I will now combine two questions uh, from Xin Xin and one from Terence. So for a company, if the boss is the one creating a fear, a, a fear environment, and also for the staff who have already been used to keeping themselves in because of past incidents, um, how should the car, uh, staff cope besides throwing the towel, uh, like uh, quitting, or mm. how do we change, uh, change the situation? Well, one of the things that you can, I think you can actively do, uh, again, this is based on experience and, and talking with people, where um, I've had people say to me, um, we have such a, a, a tough boss in our team. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, male or female, you know, really, really tough, uncompromising he or she simply does not do compassion or empathy or any of these things. There's no way on earth they would ever do anything like that. So what are we, what are we to do? Which I think is a paraphrase of the question that we've got here. Do you know, I think what we need to do is we need to start small and we need to start in our own little corner of the world. In other words, to try to positively affect the people around us to, if you like, start what I would call an agglomeration effect, an agglomeration effect. So in other words, if enough of us behave in, in a way that can be characterized as human and sensitive, if enough of us can start that movement, then over time things will change. Now, you may say to me, well, that's all fine and dandy, Michael, but I can't wait 10 years for this guy or this lady to change her behavior, right? And I think um, what you have to do is ask the question, you know, what, what is the best thing for my, my own mental well-being? What is the best thing for my own mental well-being? And I think if, you, if your judgment of the situation is such that you think, nothing is going to change anytime soon, then I think you, you, then, to, you then need to um, assess your options. But before you do that, I would suggest trying to create um, an oasis of calm and humanity in your part of the world, in your part of the organization. S see how that goes. And then uh, if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then as I say, let's be realistic. I think you have to, um, you have to assess your options then. Great advice. All right, another question from Vincent. So in your team role theory, the team player is probably the one fitting best in your ACE model, or do you see another type for that? Because team players often show too much altruism and it's to their disadvantage, right? Hey Vincent, that's a, a really, a really great, uh, a really great, great question. Um, I think your point about the, the the potential to show too much altruism um, is a, is a really is a really good one, and it, it it's also connects. Um, I know I didn't have much time to spend on it, but the notion of over identification with the problems of another person. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure whether you would call it a, a correct uh, uh, characterization of the, of, of the phenomenon, but it's almost as though there are what we might call super empaths. In other words, people who are literally so attuned in a, in a, a kind of empathetic human sense to the, um, to the troubles and problems of another person that they they can literally start to feel the pain of that person so 
I think you're, you're right that team players sometimes um, could show too much altruism to their, to their disadvantage. And I think the, the little matrix that I showed you, um, uh, that two by two, um, when, when you get the slides back, you might like to just have a quick look at the top left hand quadrant, which I have labeled the martyr, as in M-A-R-T-Y-R, the martyr. In other words, these are people who um, are highly compassionate towards other people, but they are singularly lacking in self-compassion. And when I've spoken to healthcare groups in the UK about this, um, it's, it's really very touching that in the, in the break time, um, nurses will come over to you and say, this, this is where I feel I am, you know? I spend so much time being compassionate, doing my job, thinking about other people that I'm not really, I, I don't feel like I have the time to look after myself. And I think of, you know, all of the people on the call today, I'm absolutely sure you can think of family members, perhaps people in your wider friendship circle, people who would do anything for their family or anything for their friends. And yet you might also want to ask the question, um, to, what ex to what extent are they looking after each other enough? Thank you, Michael. Okay, I have a question from Jean, Look, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, he's asking, how important is non-conscious mental processing in all these? Hello, Jean-Luc. It's, it's great to have you on the call. I think Jean-Luc is joining us from, um, from Belgium here. So um, I, I should say, actually, Kerry, that Jean-Luc is an um, extremely knowledgeable and an amazing scholar um, of um, uh, compassion uh, empathy and also artificial intelligence as well. Oh. So his question is, um, how important is non-conscious mental processing all of this? Well, I, th I think for me, John Luke, that there's a certain element to this where to do do what is almost instinctive in terms of um, how we react to certain situations. So, for example. Um, and this is perhaps where altruism really kicks in. The notion of doing something because it's the right thing to do, I think for, for many people is, is purely instinctive. There isn't, if you like, uh, a huge amount of mental processing that goes into this. So for example, when you see a child who looks like they might be drowning and just immediately going to their rescue, it's probably an instinctive thing that, that we have as human beings to, to protect and to, uh, to love other people. Thank you, Michael. All right, um, as we have a time constraint, I'll be answering just two more questions. Uh, one question is from James. Is there something that we can do with early career individuals to help them build a mindset of altruism, compassion and empathy? so that when they eventually become leaders, they bring with them the right attitude to leadership? Oh, what a wonderful question, James. I think that's a, that's a great idea. I think, I think what, whatever we can do to, um, how shall I put this, to promote the notion of altruism, compassion and empathy as, as, as a desirable set of attributes for um, leaders going forward, anything we can do to to um, enable that to happen would be would be great. So here's a couple of things that that I, I've I've come across as very interesting and perhaps not not so obvious. Um, first, one of the more obvious ones is is um, encouraging people to to do volunteering work. And again, folks on the call might say, well, you know, yeah, that's a good thing to do, and I do quite a bit of that anyway, volunteering. But another thing that's really maybe somewhat overlooked, and I noticed this in terms of um, early training of young doctors in the US, in California, for example, there is a, there is a program which has an, an elective in English literature. 
So even as you're becoming a doctor, um, one of the required courses is to take a course in English literature. And you might sort of think, whoa, why, why would you do that? If you're training to be a doctor, why would you be learning or why would you be looking at English literature? And the fact is that um, non-fiction um, is one way of learning about the world, but, but fiction is an amazing way to gain a window into the lives of other people. So when we read a, a novel, um, we're being invited to look at the world through somebody else's eyes. And the studies seem to show that when we encourage people to do things like that, something as simple as reading a piece of uh, fiction, it gives them the opportunity to exercise uh, dare I say it, that, that empathy muscle. It gives them the opportunity to see the world from a different perspective. And I just thought that was an amazing thing to do uh, on a medical program, to actually ask people to read yeah. fiction. I agree. <laughs> so um, that's just a couple of um, little things, uh, James. But um, I think uh, it's, it's all part of this agglomeration effect that I was um, proposing, which is that if enough of us are agitating for a challenge to the toxicity of so many organizations and the erstwhile uh, type of leadership that we have, then it might take a while, it might take a while, but um, maybe we can bring about some change eventually. Thank you, Michael. Okay, for the last question, I shall turn the spotlight to mental issues. So uh, how can you help as a colleague or as an organization if someone that you know has mental issues like depression or anxiety? Well, Kerry, I think that um, uh, we had some one or two um, comments a little bit earlier on, which I thought were, were, were very, very valuable. And that is that um, there are I think a multiplicity of sources available to us from professional bodies who um, deal with people who have mental health challenges. And I think that when we feel that um, someone who we know, like, or love is going through um, a difficult period, um, as I mentioned earlier, rather than saying, oh, I think you need to see somebody I think we need to actively encourage them to talk about uh, the way that they're feeling and little by little, perhaps gently suggest that they, that they seek um, professional help. Um, I think that there is a, uh, there's a type of questioning also, type of conversation that we can have with people that can um, help them to um, share the way that they're feeling without them feeling threatened. So I think, I think my, my, my biggest message here would be, let's all be very conscious of our own levels of knowledge and professional um, skill in respect of mental ill health and be very clear that um, seeking uh, the, 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 the support and input of people who are absolute specialists in the many different areas of mental ill health is absolutely uh, critical and the thing to do. Yeah. I think especially in this pandemic, it is especially important to find someone that you can trust and share if you're feeling anxious or depressed or, or being staying at home. So yeah, good advice. All right, so now that is our final question for the session. So everyone now, have a better idea of how to aid the psychological safety in the workplace. So uh, for those questions that are not answered, don't worry, we'll forward them to Michael and he will reply you accordingly. And if you would like to know more about Michael's new book, you can contact him directly as well. Okay, so thank you everyone for your participation and a big thank you to Michael for your time and valuable sharing today. We hope that you have benefited a lot from the webinar. So before we end, a gentle reminder to complete the feedback form by clicking the, the link that will appear after you leave the session. So everyone with the COVID community cases on the rise, everyone please try to stay home wherever possible and keep safe. Take care and have a great evening.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. You're welcome. Thanks, Kerry. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>